and, uh, well, a few other of the big stories because I'm now joined live looking at some of these by the political commentator Portia Berry Kilby. Morning to you, Portia. Morning, Christy. Thanks for taking the time to look through some of the big stories we're waking up to this morning. Let's start actually with what I've been discussing. Front page of the Sun newspaper this morning is saying that uh, apparently Charles and William both stepped in to block Prince Andrew having any involvement in a public capacity in the Order of the Garter ceremony today. He, he, he started to come across as this just a really annoying uncle that just wants to turn up at absolutely everything and people are saying, look, you really can't. But do you think the public can in any capacity accept him um, back in public life at all? Or is it really just going to be uh, the unfortunate occasion when the Queen's no longer with us and that ceremony or weddings and things like that where we're ever going to see him again? I think it is pretty unfortunate that Prince Charles has had his kind of fate already deemed. He's been found guilty in the court of public opinion. Prince, and, Prince Andrew. Um, Prince Andrew, you're talking about. Sorry, Prince Andrew, of yes, course. Sorry, go on. Uh, and I can't, <laughs> I can't really imagine Prince Andrew coming back from that. I think the public have made up their mind and that is going to be final. It takes a lot for that to change and has not really done much there's been no real signs of remorse because obviously he's saying he didn't do it. So it's going to be in that sticky situation, I think, for the foreseeable. And to what extent, we had a caller earlier saying, well, look, he, he's just a victim of his privilege and a victim of his own stupidity. And unfortunately, sort of being in that gilded cage means that he doesn't have much intelligence and he doesn't know how to deal with situations. If, if, if you and I... I think it's quite unlikely because we both like, have a modicum of intelligence. But if you and I had been found to be staying with a paedophile after they'd been convicted because they had quite a nice place in New York, I'm quite sure if we were caught doing that or if we reflected on doing that, we would say, oh, my word, what an absolute disaster that was. We were so stupid. What were we doing? Whereas we've had none of that from him. But is that because he's a victim of the privilege that he's had and it's kind of not his fault? Well, I don't know who his advisors are, because whoever said it was a good idea he did that interview where it was just an ordinary shooting weekend, you know, come on. I think he's kind of helped himself to this end of condemning himself by the public. It's not... Obviously, people make mistakes in the past, but he's definitely just heaped on the errors since then. Well, I was just saying before, I sometimes just watch that interview in my own time, because it's just a masterclass of... of bad disaster management. I mean, you just... you just And Emily Maitlis, I mean, like, love or loathe her, and I think she's had her controversies around giving her opinion and stuff, but I think that should be shown to journalism students everywhere, that interview, because I think that that is one of her finest moments as a journalist, the way in which she gets to the point, and the way in which she stays silent as well sometimes and just lets him just keep talking. It's amazing. It is absolutely... It is. Uh, amazing. Now, of course, we've seen on another royal story, um, Prince Charles this weekend. Now, they were private comments, but he did apparently uh, make some, some, some rather scathing remarks about the government's plan to send migrants to Rwanda. We're seeing on some of the front pages of today's newspapers that there are somewhere in the region, I think over 30 uh, cases now, where human rights lawyers are trying to block these deportation flights. Um, what do you say about that? I think it's interesting when you have a situation that the court is deciding what's legal rather than the government. The government has written this law um, and come up with this plan to deal with the migrant crisis, and then it's being blocked at every turn. At the end of the day, there's always going to be two sides, but the High Commissioner for Rwanda to the UK today had a piece in the Telegraph which was saying people are being too quick to judge. We've met various targets, we're doing well, these are very much outdated stereotypes in people's minds. I think maybe there is some slight form of racism here that you just think Rwanda, not you personally, but people think Rwanda is a backwards country and that everyone who goes there is doomed. Um, I mean, it's quite, it's, quite, it's quite an impassioned piece by him, actually. I'm, 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 I've, I've got it here, and it's by uh, 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 the High Commissioner, as you said, for the Rwanda to 
the UK. And, um, yeah, he's basically saying we're ready to do our duty. We are the right partner for this initiative. We've got a deep connection to those seeking safety and opportunity in a new land that, that they have... Uh, uh, Rwanda as a country is consistently uh, the uh, a part of the UN uh, Human Rights um, Council as well, and that actually, you know, we need to get out of these outdated views of of Rwanda because they're happy to step up and do their duty on this. Um, I, I don't know. Is this perhaps the government sort of nudging him to write this, or do you think that this is genuine? That 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 there is perhaps a little bit of a sneering attitude towards Rwanda that people are having when it comes to this. I think it's a bit of both. Of course, the UK wants Rwanda to come on board, but at the same time, there is definitely a sneer in the UK population, or the kind of the more slightly educated, more liberal parts of the UK saying, oh, how awful to be sent to Rwanda, when at the day, have, how many of them have visited the country? How do many of them know the real situation on the ground? And for sure, I can imagine going to Rwanda for some groups would be awful, especially on set and human rights records. Rwanda isn't the best, but on many, it's doing pretty well. And if you've escaped the persecution that a lot of these migrants have done, then it is a safe place. They've got accommodation until their papers are processed. And it seems a good deterrent for people who would illegally cross the channel. I mean, I have to be honest, I don't love the Rwanda plan. I don't love it, but uh, it, it depends on what parameters you are judging it by. If you're judging it by um, the capacity for us to try and process people, I can see why some people see it as a bit inhumane, going somewhere so far when you've done everything to get here, and there are going to be some legitimate people who are who are wanting to stay in the UK, however, and have the right to be in the UK. However, having said that... If your parameters are, look, we just want to stop people making the crossing on the channel. Well, in Australia, when they processed people off the shores of Australia, that worked. It made the number of people crossing over to Australia absolutely plummet. So I think that there is nuance to this conversation. And I think that, as I say, it depends on what parameters you want to judge it by. I think that's very fair. And at the end of the day, there is a deterrent as part of this plan. If they were sending, the, if the plan was to send them to Barbados, then obviously that's not going to be working. There has to be, and maybe that is due to public perception of Rwanda has to be negative in order for this plan well, to work. That's a good work. point. It's, it's almost like they can't send them to somewhere too glamorous because otherwise they would be, you know, great, you sign me up, you know, get, get me. But uh, I think that the solution really would and should have been, and I don't think France would have ever done this, that, that we process people in France. I mean, to me, that would have made this policy almost the perfect way of solving this. You have a processing centre in France. If you bypass that processing centre, then you're sent to Rwanda immediately. So, that therefore, that people have the capacity of trying somewhere first and then being sent to Rwanda, but of course France wouldn't do that because France is in absolutely no hurry to help process people on the chance that they could be brought to the UK. Exactly, and France definitely isn't our biggest fan. Um, so we have Rwanda, and I think maybe the biggest failure of this plan is to impose this as um, the system in place for migrants who came across before this plan was announced. I don't think you can retrospectively announce it to impact those who've already come across. And to what extent, just uh, finishing this, this conversation, to what extent is it fair that Prince Charles or previously the Archbishop of Canterbury weighed into this and, 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 and give their opinions on it? Is that the job? of people who are in privilege and power to talk about this or is it not something that you find palatable? To be fair, I think Prince Charles, he said the comments in private and if you are a friend or an aide of Prince Charles and have true allegiance to him, you shouldn't then be saying that more widely. If you were to come out more publicly and say it, I'd have more of an issue, but these were leaked private comments. Um, which I don't think he can really be pulled over the cobbles for. He'll have an opinion, and if he goes public with it intentionally, then there's an issue. 
And what about the Archbishop of Canterbury when he did? I think Archbishop of Canterbury is a tricky one because he often riles the wrong or ruffles the wrong feathers of certain camps. Um, he, but I think he's in a position to have a say on these things. He's the head of the Church of England, which caters for the spiritual dimension of person, but also for the whole person as well. So inevitably, there should be some overlap with politics. But annoyingly, it's not. It's often one-sided with Archbishop. It's well, interesting because I completely disagree. I really, I think that you're in a really difficult situation when you're someone like Prince Charles, and I'll take what you say about the private stuff, but certainly the Archbishop of Canterbury, because immediately when you've got someone in a position like the Archbishop of Canterbury criticising this, well, firstly, you criticised it and didn't offer an alternative, but secondly, the, uh, the, the Church of England owns billions, it's one of the biggest landowners, if not the biggest landowner in the United Kingdom. They have the capacity. They, they build houses themselves sometimes. Very few of them affordable. You know, when you are in a situation where you're head of an organisation that can help solve some of the problems that have led to the public feeling about Rwanda, as in housing, well, you're really not in a position to then criticise the Rwanda plan. The Rwanda plan might be terrible, but show me that you've built X number of affordable houses first, and then I'll listen to you, because it's in your power to solve this. And that's why I think he was misjudged. I think that's very fair. And I think that's also maybe conceding that he can say some things, but he has to be consistent. And you've got to put your money where your mouth that. is. You've got to put your money where your mouth is. No one would be talking about Rwanda plan if we didn't have a housing crisis, for instance. But then when the Church of England have built houses, they've been, they've been, not barely any of them have been affordable because they profit from them. So they, he is, his organisation is profiting from the very circumstance that is leading to this policy <laughs> taking place. So it's hypocrisy. Um, anyway, when we come back, we'll talk about Gatwick Airport. God, if the Earth ever needed an enema, I think Gatwick Airport might be the point of entry as things stand at the moment. But anyway, we'll talk about that when we come back uh, right here, live from the Talk Radio studio. It's Christo here on Talk TV. Morning, Christo here on Talk TV. We're live from the Talk Radio studio. How are you this morning? Thanks for your company. Still taking a deeper delve into some of the big stories that you are waking up to this morning from the newspapers, joined by Portia Berry Kilby, political commentator. And uh, uh, let's move on to one of your next stories. It's a familiar story. It's a story that anyone who's going on holiday will send a chill down their spine. I am taking a flight from Gatwick in the next couple of months and I will be doing so with not much time to spare because I'm going shortly after work and I'm worried because it, 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 it sounds like it's absolute it's almost like the Hunger Games to get through <laughs> Gatwick Airport or any of these airports and it's happening nightly right? It is. And to be fair, Christo, I'd have a contingency plan if I were you. Uh, so it doesn't seem to be getting any better. Today, there was an article in Times that Gatwick Airport was facing continued struggles. And every night, apparently, it was a meltdown was their word. So, you know, things aren't improving. It's very much the photos of two weeks ago last week are still there. And the airlines says that it was due to a couple of illnesses and basic star shortages you know if only if only when it came to the airport if only there was some sort of booking system where <laughs> people who need to go through an airport there would be some way that they could have pre-booked and the airport and the airlines would know how many people w were coming i mean has no one ever thought of that kind of system Apparently not. No. It honestly baffles the mind. Clearly, it's a complete surprise when people turn up with their luggage. And they, oh, we had no idea. We had no idea you were going to be here. But, I mean, this, on a more serious note, I mean, we've seen the piles of luggage, we've seen the queues, but this is more worrying because this is actually um, a, a problem with air traffic control. Control. So, yeah. apparently, there's growing frustration among airlines that there isn't enough resources to handle the surge in flights and a senior aviation... Um, source said that the airport is now having to put restrictions on movements per hour below its declared capacity because of a shortage of air traffic controllers in the approach control function. Now, don't get me wrong, I mean, I can probably handle a couple of, you know, baggage handlers that aren't there, a few checkout staff you might not have, a couple of people on immigration, but the ones you really can't do without 
our air traffic controllers. Entirely. And this shows that it's not just the airline's fault, but it's the airport's fault as well. Um, and it tends to be a continual pointing of fingers at one party to the next. I think multiple parties are to blame. And to, to what extent do you think that we're allowing the government off the hook on this? We spoke to Vicky Price earlier and she was saying, uh, telling us about the boss of International Airlines Group. Now, that's the group that owns Iberia and British Airways. I think it's one of, if not the biggest um, conglomerate of airlines that we have. And uh, the boss there said, look, this, this isn't our fault, this is the government's fault, essentially saying that there was a period at the end of furlough before the government was prepared to open up travel, probably a six or eight month period there where there was no help and the airline simply had to let people go because the, the people couldn't travel and that's because the government still had these restrictions. So are we being unfair on the airlines and the airports because actually had furlough been extended or perhaps more importantly, travel opened up sooner, we wouldn't be in the situation where people would have had to have been let go. Well, I think the point about traveling, travel opening up sooner is definitely valid and fair. And if there had been fewer restrictions, we wouldn't be in this pickle anyway. But at the end of the day, if the government has given months and months worth of furlough money, and then the airlines, that's the end of that, is still letting people go. I think there is an onus on the airlines. They've had the money and kept their employees for this length of time. They should have had a better plan in place to keep workers on long term or have more. But if they, if, but if, but if, if they had, but but the problem is they didn't have any customers. You know, if you're an airline, it's your job to fly. If you can't fly, then how, what, how are you supposed to pay to keep your staff on? For sure, but I think there could have been easier ways to bring staff back should they want the jobs after a short, after say six months off, because you can't keep them on. Um, but a temporary break, or knowing that there will be a surge in six months' time, and making preparations to hire new staff. I mean, I think that the I'm not there yet. Now I'm thinking about the government opening up, but I think that the excuse about the government is going to wear thin soon if they don't sort it out, because we're hearing stories that this might go on for another 18 months or so. Uh, why don't we end on a nice story? Because um, talking of COVID and the restrictions and, uh, and the like, uh, a few charities popped up, didn't they, during COVID uh, to make it easier for neighbours to help each other and all of those sorts of things. And there's a story in The Guardian today about that, isn't there? There is. And the story in The Guardian says that four in ten of these charities or charity type groups that propped up, popped up over COVID are still in place and helping in the community. Now, this kind of has two receptions because on the one side, it's very nice that they're there and lasting and have shifting to the demands of the day. Though there's one founder of one of these groups who's quoted in The Guardian saying, she shouldn't be there. It's not her job to fill gaps left by the government. But then if that were the case, there would never be charity ever, which seemed a bit of a bleak response from her, who heads up one of these organisations. Yeah, June Tobin, her name is, one of the founders yeah. of... So, so the, the story is saying that I think about 40%, 41% of some of these, they're called mutual aid groups, where, you know, it makes it easier for neighbours to be able to interact with each other, help each other out, get themselves uh, what they need. And June Tobin, one of the founders of one of the groups, said that the demand just didn't go away. Lots of industries were hard hit by the pandemic and didn't recover. So people were out of work. We then saw the increase in the cost of living, which is hurting people. People are in work poverty. They can't afford to feed themselves. Um, but the concept of mutual aid is actually rooted in um, anarchic communism, apparently. Why do they have to ruin everything by calling it communism? Can't it just be kindness? Of course, that would have to be in a Guardian article. <laughs> it wouldn't, wouldn't it? You know, we can't just say, oh, it's nice and everyone's sort of, you know, being nice to each other. No, it has to be rooted in communism. It's unbelievable, really. A uh, government spokesperson said that charities had received about at least £750 million pounds worth of support to meet challenges of the pandemic and um, a lot of these charities still exist. Nice to talk to you. Thanks for taking the time to look through some of those stories. Nice to hear that people are still uh, helping each other out as well. And uh, nice to have your company. Thank you, Portia Berry Kilby, political commentator.